the awkward <laughs> intro with a little tomato, some salt, call it a day. Oh, mm. we're live. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yay. I don't know which part the uh, editor is going to catch. My editor, Tyler, by the way, for, for you guys, he's amazing. You guys, if you ever need an editor, he'll do it for a PSN card. That's how great the guy is. I oh, love it. Go, Tyler. Yay. Thank you, Tyler. So, all right, then we pause and I do an intro. <clears throat> whoa, 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 whoa. For a PSN card, coach, come on, give me a little credit here. I've been doing this for the, you know, from the bottom of my heart all this time. And then you happen to give me a PSN card. So, no, I didn't do it for, you know, monetary value. I did it for you. Although the PSN card was pretty nice. Shut up and sit down. Hello, family. Welcome to PSVGOT episode 22. I am your host, Coach Mo, and here with me today is the one and only Steve Waldinger. Hey. From all the great things he's been here before and also joining us is a brand new guest brought by my buddy steve is ms donna literisi from draw dvl productions Hi. how are we doing today folks uh, we are fantastic we We're have good. just come yeah. from day two of wondercon uh, yeah wondercon's lots of fun very busy yeah this is the show of the San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> that's what i've heard i heard it is the most wonder field of comic con exactly yes it is it is a wondrous wonder con <laughs> Like other Comic Cons have some wonder, but this one has like the highest amount of wonder. It does. So that's that's what I was what their their brochure said. So I was really thankful for that. It used um, to be just a Wonder Woman and Wonder Man con, um, con but then it's evolved over the years. <laughs> and it's in Anaheim. It's near Disney, so it's near Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland just got oh, all the wonder Wonderland is banging. So little little known fact, people don't know this. My second favorite Disney person is the Cheshire Cat. Oh I'm my god, a I love huge. the Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat fan. Uh, when I was one a is little Putin. girl and I tried to get my way, I'd be like, I'm going to do the Cheshire Cat kitty grin. And then I'd make a big scary grin. <laughs> that only some of the time works, but I tried. I tried it. Time out. How do you pronounce that? Cheshire? I think huh. it's Cheshire or Cheshire. Oh. I mean, Cheshire is like the proper British ah. word. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, I was oh, like, whoa, British I've never heard it said that way, but I also don't hang out with other British people. It's kind of a, <laughs> kind of a no for me. I'm Irish. We, we're not a huge fan of, <laughs> of we're the, gonna uh, to the, to the right. <laughs> so, like, we'll, we'll, we'll serve high tea and sip our. <laughs> it's like people say Cecil or Cecil, Cheshire, Cheshire, whatever you want to say. Mm. I think it's pretty. Respect. I, I do love, see, as a teacher, I love being taught. So I'll take it. I'll take it and run with it. So I'm so happy to have you guys on here. Uh, so what had happened was our normal co-host, my boy, Dev, he's been going through some stuff and he was like, uh, Mo, I just, I can't make it. I was like, all right, I, me and Steve, we have like this, this comic connection. I was like, Steve, are you available tonight? Is yes. Can I bring Donna? I was like, yes i love it when people come on so i am so glad you guys are here it, it was willing i'm i'm very excited to be staying up this late like normally i'm in bed at about eight it's 12 25 and i'm jacked to be here like i've got the goosebumps i'm ready to go so oh yeah yeah <laughs> so this is PSPGOT, uh and we are a relational podcast and we're here for two reasons one to share memories to tech and connect with our family on the interwebs and two to dominate unpreparedness. So like I ask every week, have either of you been prepared for tonight's show? <laughs> we found out we were no. doing it like uh, two hours ago. So no, <laughs> I have actually never been on a podcast before. So this is my first time. <laughs> Yay. Well, I'm glad that your first podcast can be totally unprepared and OT in this. So our main topic for tonight is what was your biggest hype let down? And we want you to walk us through it. So I'll tell my story first, giving you guys some time to, to wrap your head around yours. Now, I remember I was a young coach, Mo. This was uh Back in 2013, before all the old age and the coaching injuries and all the things that happened. And I remember going and waiting in line for my PS4. I was so excited. I went to the midnight launch. I was I was hyped up and ready to go. It's like, yes, this is my very first console launch. I'm here at the midnight. I'm going to pick this bad boy up. I'm going to go home. And I'm going to set it up. 
Midnight launches, if you've never been to one, are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> now, I'm a very large man. Uh, for Our community knows it, but Donna, Donna doesn't, and I want to make sure she understands this picture. Uh, I'm about 6'7", almost 6'8", 350 pounds, very large man. Oh, yeah. And I'm standing there in line, and, and it, it's almost time for the kickoff, for the opening. And so the manager... He has these guys pushing in line, and he goes, uh, Mo, could, could you help me out? And I walk over, and I'm, like, just stand there trying to listen to these guys. Having, and I'm, like, hey, guys, can we calm down? So the manager does me a solid because I helped him out, and he lets me get my console about 20 minutes early or so and leave. I'm, like, how could this night get any better? <laughs> this is the best thing in the world. Now, I pre-ordered this camera. See, the PS4 came with this sweet camera you plug in. And so I go home and I set it all up and I'm so jacked to jump into this camera and all the games. And guys, there's, there's one game on it and it, you, it's got these little play robot thingies and it's not very good. So then I go in to play Madden and the online service isn't working. Oh no. And so I just sit there going, I just wanted to play some Madden with my buddies. We can't get online. I don't know what's happening. And I remember going to bed just defeated. Now, I I love the games. I love all games. I love, you know, the the sports and, and the 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 board games and the video games. But I remember that night going in with such high expectations and going home so devastated. And so that was my biggest hype letdown. So Donna, what was your biggest hype letdown? Hmm, I've probably had a couple throughout Hmm. my time on Earth. I would say one was when I was in college, I did a 24-hour play festival. I uh, went to a liberal arts college, so I studied uh, drawing, and I also studied uh, psychology, and I also studied theater, and I was mostly a playwriting person. And uh, 24-hour play festivals, if you're writing the play, you basically are up for the entire 24 hours, and you get a theme, and you stay up all night writing it, and then the next day you meet the people who are the actors in the play and then the director. And if you're young and starry-eyed, you think like, "Wow, great! I'll get to help and be part of it and not have a lot of sleep." But this will be really exciting. But depending on who you get as your director, that's not actually what happens. So I was really hyped. I was really excited. I had been up all night. I had written a play, and it was going to be produced, and it was going to have two shows later that night. And unfortunately, when you work in playwriting, sometimes you'll have a great director who's really cool and wants to work with you. And other times it's kind of like you're supposed to stop existing once you've written it. And um, I was really hyped for this production and to get my work out there. I was young. I was uh, I was 19. And the guy who was directing my play actually at one point like he kind of briefly ran through the script with the actors but then he had them off book after they read it once so it was almost as if what i wrote didn't matter at all and uh when the actors were getting lines wrong and then if they said a line that was like later in the play too early it would kind of mess up the entire narrative and so ultimately when you've written something like this and you're watching it go on it's just it makes it look like you wrote something that doesn't make any sense as opposed to just like there's like kind of like an acting thing going on or like a directing thing. So that was a pretty big hype and disappointment because it was exciting to get my work out there. But then one, it was not going forward in the best way it could have been presented. And then two, it was just clearly I was working with a director who did not really care about anything I'd done or anything I'd written. And he was a grad student who was quite a bit older than me. So he seemed to also kind of want to be putting me in my place. So that made me very sad. But the, good kind of moral of the story was that the actors felt bad for me and understood my position and they ended up kind of sneaking away from the director and going over some lines and going over some stuff with me and making sure that they understood the play a little better and they actually got some of the lines right and it was a 24-hour play festival where they did two performances back to back and one performance they got some stuff wrong but the other they worked really hard and they actually delivered the script i had written so that was really cool so even though it was a hype and a disappointment situation it was nice that some people involved were like hey no we don't want you to be sad we're gonna try and get this right and do this right and I actually did that play festival twice. And the first time, the first time I did it was I was 18, and that's the one I'm talking about. I misremembered. Second time I did it was 19, it went a lot better. Hey. Yeah. Yay. Mm-hmm. 
Man, so during that, I was getting real angry. I was like, me and this director, we're going to have problems. You don't, mess, <laughs> you don't mess with the Donster. You're not going to do that, buddy. I've never been like, that before. I, I, will, been I will Donner Hulk like, out. Like the reindeer, but not the Donster. <laughs> Until yeah. now. Until I will now. Hulk out, sir. That's not going to go down <laughs> well. So you, you, after the show, let's, uh, let's give me that name, and I'll go have a nice conversation. <laughs> no, we don't treat friends of the OT that way. That's not <laughs> that. Mo um, Smash. While I was listening to this, I want you to know that one of my best friends is actually in Little Rights College right now, and he's going. He went to school first with me. We were both going to be teachers together, played football together. Great guy. His name's Maddie. And after a couple of years of teaching, he was like, "Dude, I really want to make movies." And so I was like, "You're married with two kids. You have two options: one, move in with your parents and go to school and learn how to make movies; two, keep teaching forever and be miserable." He did the first one. Really smart guy, Maddie. Really smart guy. So he actually graduates in December. And I told him, I was like, because I helped push you for this, you have one job. I want to be a villain in a great movie. I want to be like the most villainy villain of all time. So he has to write me a villainy role. And I told him all the things I wanted. It's like, I want to be like Darth Vader, only way meaner. <laughs> I just want to be like the well, best. That's going to be your name in the movie, Darth Meaner. I, that would be so cool. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It could be a Star Wars futuristic type movie. I don't care. I just want to be a cool villain. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Stevie, man, um, what was your biggest uh, hype letdown? And then walk us through it. Tell us the story. It, it was Spider-Man number three. I was, um, to this day, y'all, as you can see, I'm, uh, we might have touched on it briefly in the uh, the last OTA I was on, but in case, you know, for a refresher slash, you know, somebody new to me, meeting me for the first time. By the way, very nice to meet you, by the way. Hello. Um, but Spider-Man is my all-time favorite superhero of all time. Spider-Man is, to me, what uh, the Hulk is to Mo. Um, and so it goes beyond, without saying that I've, I've loved a good portion of the Spider-Man movies that have come out. Um, it was just, I was in shock and awe and wonderment when Spider-Man came out, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. The second Spider-Man just blew me away. Like, to this day, it is held that it is my all-time favorite comic book movie. And I don't foresee any movie taking this back. I mean, like the next you know, Avengers looks cool with, you know, with everybody in it, but I still don't think it's going to overtake Spider-Man too. Just everything with that movie clicked. It like really nailed the essence of Spider-Man. So, you know, at the time of Spider-Man two, after seeing this and how amazing this was, I, and you know, I, I noted that it was, you know, I was thought Spider-Man was really good. Spider-Man two was so amazing that I was like, Wow, Spider-Man 3 is going to be the bestest thing of all time. It got to the point that before it premiered in the U.S., it had a premiere. It's like world premiere was in Japan. I gave very, very, very serious consideration to uh, flying out to Japan just to see wow. Spider-Man 3. I didn't end up doing this, but I, I do remember playing the game Desert Island where like you pick like five like movies that you would take with you on a desert island. I think I picked for one of those movies. Um, one of the movies was the uh, Tom Hanks movie where he gets stuck on the island. Oh, um, Castaway. Castaway, yeah. So that way I could get back. But like the second movie I picked was Spider Man Three. My logic being. I've already seen the first two Spider-Men. I want to make sure I'm, I'm able to watch Spider-Man 3 as often as I want to on this island because it's going to be so amazing. And so I finally get to go see Spider-Man 3 in the theater. It's, I go to a midnight screening, which is relatively rare for me. Um, I, I only go if it's like something I really, really, really want to see. And that was, of course, the movie I really, really, really wanted to see. So I go to the theater and I see the movie and I see... Toby Maguire doing the tap dance. And I'm just like, I was managed to leave the movie theater convincing myself that it was a good movie. When in my heart of hearts, I knew it was a disappointment. And um, I've since, I, I've, you know, I watched it in full one other time. And um, I came away from it less enthused than the first time. And then I've only watched bits and pieces here since. And I've, I've accepted the fact that Spider-Man 3 is not a good movie. Um, it was such such disappointment from such epic hype that I had. I've never seen this movie. <laughs> no? Well, I, um, I don't think... I think I've only seen two Spider-Man movies. The Homecoming one mm -hmm. and the one with the dude with the, the big hair. 
Um, let's see. Did you see? You saw the Andrew Garfield ones, right? That's or what I'm you? talking about. He had one oh. with where what's her name dies in the end. Uh, okay, yeah, that was that was Amazing Spider Man too, and that was that wasn't as big of a letdown, but it was. A, some, I liked the first Amazing Spider Man they did with Andrew Garfield. Then the second one was a disappointment. They went the cartoony route with like the villains. Like Electro is a he's a he's a force to be reckoned with, but in the in the movie he was basically like a glorified joke. And yeah, but yeah, it wasn't sense. as big of a letdown as it was from going from Spider Man two to Spider Man three. Hmm. All right, man. Well, those are some those are some good hype moments, and I'm sad that they all turned out that way for us. Now we have some questions today, and I'm pretty jacked about these. I'm very excited. Um, these come from my students. Uh, what we do is we put them in a little hat and we draw them out, and uh, we got rid of the names. I don't remember why. Something happened, and we decided to get rid of names. So I don't think on the one I was on, we didn't have names. I don't think. Okay. Or, yeah, I just I can never remember when we did that. Like when that choice was made. So here's our first question: um, Who do you think the better marksman is, Link from Legend of Zelda or Laura Croft? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm gonna go with um, Link. That's just my gut answer: is Link. Respect because he, he would be more of an archer than he would be a um, uh, a gunsman, and I think you need yeah. you need more accuracy. You learn more accuracy using a bow than you would with a firearm. Yeah, okay. I would agree with that. It takes a certain amount of attention to detail, and being able to be an archer is something that a lot of people can't do. So I would agree with Link. Now I'm actually uh, I've I've seen I watched the Laura Croft the new Tomb Raider movie. I played both the the new release games. My Laura Croft uses a bow and arrow really well and oh, cool. handguns. And so because I have that experience with her, I'm going to go with Laura Croft on this one. Um, I do think Link, you know, he's got to be real talented because it's like one of his main weapons. But I think because Laura also has to do the whole dual wielding pistols and using, wow. you know, there's more marksmanship available for, for the LC than there is for the Link. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to go yeah. with. Yeah, um, to be accurate with a pistol, that's an, that is an incredible feat of uh, marksmanship. Yeah. To be accurate with a double pistol, two of them. Yes. Woo. Yeah. So. All right. All right. Our next one. If you could make any Marvel movie, what would it be? We'll start off with Steve and then we'll move to the dumpster. Okay. This is getting increasingly hard to answer because they're making so many Marvel movies now. Um, like, I'm tempted to say Squirrel Girl, but actually, I'm going to go with Squirrel Girl only because. Um, Squirrel Girl's not getting her own solo thing right away. She's going to be on the, I believe she's going to be on the New Warriors TV show. Uh, so I'm going to go with the unbeatable Squirrel Girl because that universe that they've created in the comic is just so fun. That, yeah. um, comics, is, you know, for as many people as read comics, movies reach that many more people. So I want the whole world to share in the excellence that is the unbeatable Squirrel Girl. If they don't have an episode where she's uh, dating a sentinel, it's the, oh, yes. you, 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 you messed up. Like you just, you ruined it. So, <laughs> so true. All right, Donna, how about you? I do really like squirrel girl and that's a very good answer. Mm. Uh, I know it's already a Netflix show, but I think a Jessica Jones movie would be very cool. Oh she's man, I would be down. Yeah, I mean, she's really strong, she's really intense, and she's sort of a more everyday superhero. And I kind of like how the, the show approaches it, and they, they think they call them people with powers. And it's just like, it's not quite the thing where she's wearing like a whole outfit and a cape, and it's like oh, so much of production is just kind of like, she has these enormous powers that are just part of her. And I think it's great as a show, but it would be really cool to have it be like a more kind of contained narrative in a film version. So that's what I would make if I were making a Marvel movie. Because of when I saw the first Jessica season, I went and got my hands on the comics and all the things that like intertwine with it. And there's so much I'm like waiting for to happen with Jessica yeah. Jones. I'm waiting for Hellcat to turn into a thing. Yes. I'm waiting, I know, for, yeah. waiting for some She-Hulk. I'm waiting for all these great things that should be able to happen. I'm yeah. waiting for her to have her baby. Like things that need to happen. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's a TV show. They're going to be able to draw it out a lot longer. So I guess we're going to be waiting for a while. And I will wait patiently. <laughs> um, so normally my gut is we remake Thor Ragnarok, get that piece of trash out of there and give me a real <laughs> Planet Hulk. But I know they can't do it. So if I'm going to make one, 
I'm going to make a Miss Marvel movie. Yes. Oh, and yeah. Cool. It's going to be all about her and the whole high school thing and growing with her powers and how to use them and the relationship dynamic. Like that is some of my favorite stuff that's in there is like her getting home and her family giving her crap. I was like, why can't you act like your brother and do this, this, and this? And she's going against those cultural norms and becoming her own individual. I would love more of that. I don't even need her to be tied into an Avengers at all. Just let her have her one movie and I would go nuts. I would be so happy. That'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. Love me some Miss Marvel. Mm -hmm. Um, Our next one, if you, so, so you're given the gift to make the best music ever. What style of music are you making? Uh, we'll go with Donna first on this one. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. I have such an eclectic taste. I like so many different things. Um, what kind of music would I make? Um, okay, so things that I like. I like a lot of 80s alternative mm-hmm. rock, like Depeche Mode. I like things like Interpol. I'm also really nerdy, and I like a lot of Disney songs, and I like show tunes, and I like really silly songs, like that song about wanting a hippopotamus for <laughs> Christmas. So if I were to make a certain, I don't know if I'd make a genre of music so much as I would either make a song that would be really catchy and either people would just think it was fun and funny to sing and to make them laugh, or I'd want to make something which was probably the, you know, the thing everywhere parents would not want to hear just because it's like going to be played over and over again, but like an anthem, like something mm-hmm. like Let It Go. Or something really, really catchy, like theme song wise, like the theme from Phantom of the Opera. I don't know if you're familiar with Phantom, but like da na 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 da na 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 na. Anyway, something earwormy, whether it was earwormy because it was just catchy to listen to, or funny, or kind of empowering. So, not sure I actually answered your question, but I I, I low key I bought the Moana soundtrack, and uh, I've been listening to that like at work in the car. Um, my, so some of my, my softball girls sing it. Um, it's like, they're like their hype song and I got hooked and I'm like, ah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Are you, uh, oh, just a quick question. Are you at all a frozen fan? Um, I've watched it like twice. So here's the thing. Um, I, I'm, uh, I have ADD. Uh, not a lot of people know that about me. Um, so I don't sit well. And so for me to go watch TV or to watch a movie for, longer than 20 minutes requires me to get up and walk around like five or six times. So I don't watch a lot of the movies. Um, but yeah, so I think I've seen it at least twice. I did enjoy the let it go song. I like the one where she's uh, the cold doesn't bother me anyway more though. Yeah. But no, I was just asking cause uh, they've actually just turned into a Broadway musical and I'm super obsessed with all the songs mm-hmm. from the Broadway musical. The Broadway musical is cool. I mean, it will be difficult to sit through cause they've made it longer, but they've also expanded upon the backstory and Elsa gets more songs. So you hear a lot more of her internal monologue and being very afraid and not wanting to hurt anyone with her powers. But yeah, nice. if you look up on Fro- frozen Broadway on YouTube, dangerous to dream is a really cool song, I think. And so is the song monster monsters kind of like let it go with the second act, but Anyway. I'll check it out. I'll, yeah. I'll, I will try anything once. That's how I got into the comics, and now I'm hooked. So, Steve, what kind of music are you making? I think I would bring back, I miss the theme songs from 80s and 90s TV shows. Um, it seems like nowadays it's like the theme songs aren't, because you can skip them now with like, you know, when you're watching Netflix and, and stuff like that. So it's like, if you have the option to skip it, I, I generally have been skipping most of the theme songs. I listened to them once, but not, and none of them has really hooked me. So I would make like the ultimate '80s and '90s theme song of all time, and it would just overtake everything in the world. All right, respect. No, hey, do you? Um, so I have gone like seven different ways in this, and the whole time I've since I've seen this question, <laughs> and for me, like the problem is, it's the moments I would want to be able to capture. Um, at the end of Last of Us, the song of the guitar. Um, there's a, a song that's circling right now by Hobo Johnson um, called Peach Scones that my kids adore. They love it. And I like it because it's got this pretty heartfelt, different meaning from a guy who you wouldn't expect to be this poetic rapper. Um, but I, at the end of the day, I just want to be part of Boys to Men. Yes. So <laughs> my base would be deep enough so I could become the fourth member of uh, Boys to Men and me and Wanye, we could go out and do things and and life would be good. So that would be me. I would just bring back some more R&B love. Um, but in lieu of that, <laughs> if you want, we could start a, um, a Boys to Men cover band called Boys to Mo. Oh, yes. See? <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, our next one, what is your favorite book and why? Steve. 
Ooh. Um, I think I want to say my favorite book is The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. I haven't read it in a very long time, um, but I do remember being enamored with it upon reading it. And I think it's one of those rare books that I actually reread not having to read it for a school assignment. The first time I read it, it was because it was assigned to me at school. But the yeah, second time I was like, oh, I'm going to read this again on my own. And um, yeah, the second time, like some of the stuff that they were talking about um, initially, I was, uh, are we still there? We Mo went out on the screen. Yeah, yeah, no, I just clicked okay. it because I was grabbing it. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, nope, yeah. good, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tyler, at the 30 minute mark, exit this out. <laughs> Uh, some of the themes like kind of went over my head a little bit the first time I read it. So more of them sunk in the second time. And yeah, and that, that book made me want to read it again. So um, that book, I think, gets a gets uh, shout out as my favorite book. All right. Respect. Uh, Donna, how about you? I have many, many, many favorite books. Um, I'm going to go with a book which is a more new favorite. It's called Year of the Beasts. It's a combination young adult novel, and it's also partially a graphic novel. Every other chapter is different. So the first chapter is a regular chapter in prose form, and then the second chapter is a graphic novel chapter. And it's a coming-of-age story about two girls, and it's about their relationship as sisters and kind of like strife and drama and competition. And there are a lot of also very sad themes in the book having to do with kind of grief and loss and coming of age and growing up. But the interesting thing is the prose chapter takes place in the modern day. And then the graphic novel chapters look as if they're kind of like a modernized version of Greek mythological characters. But the cool thing about this book is it can either be read entirely as one piece. And then you realize, Oh, they're actually like different versions of the same characters and all fits together. Or if you were to just read the prose parts and then just read the pages, which are drawn like a comic book, then they completely work as two separate stories. So I really, really think that's a beautifully done young adult book because the art is great. The storytelling is great. It's relatable and funny and tragic and beautiful. And I just, I think it's a really cool thing because I believe very much in not only prose for literature, but also a graphic novel. So the fact that this book combines narrative storytelling with images as well as words makes it one of my favorite books. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's by Cecil Castellucci, and then Nate Powell did oh, the graphic novel portion of it. Yeah, I know. So I actually met Cecil. Yeah, she's uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah Cecil person. or Cecil, I guess I think, that, that debate yeah. is probably not how to say it. <laughs> that whole British thing again. <laughs> British. Cheerio. <laughs> All right. Um, for me, it's uh, The 13 and a Half Lives of Captain Blue Bear. Um, and the reason I think that, that book still sticks with me, uh, right now our library had to go buy three more. Uh, this year because we had five but two kids didn't bring them back um so they had to get more uh because my kids keep wanting to read it because it's it's my favorite book and the reason is when i first touched that book i was just a football player uh i didn't have a personality i just worried about being in the weight room and hitting people and that was my job that's who i was and i remember this really pretty girl who later became my wife um we actually went on a date to the mall of America because uh, she was up there to watch a football game. And we went into this place called Barnes and Nobles that sells books. And I don't think I'd ever been in this place until then. And uh, I go, Oh, that's a huge book. And it has a picture of a bear on it. She goes, you want it? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I will. I will get this. I like bears. And uh, I started reading it. And this author is one of the most creative, imaginative people on the planet. And as I continued to read it, I just fell so in love with the character. Like I quote uh, probably five or six different quotes out of that book to my students on the regular. Uh, one of them is when bad habits become habit, you turn over a new leaf. That's, that's from the book. What I love about it is I learned that it, like what imagination looked like because I didn't have it. And like this, this author puts an entire city inside of a tornado. Um, and that's one of the places this Captain Blue Bear goes during his 13 and a half uh, lives. Um, and it was just a huge moment for me. Like it was one of those things that I'll remember forever is, and I read that book once a year, every year, and I have it plastered all over my, uh, my office. So my kids know that coach most favorite book is, and, uh, they, they're always there to ask questions and talk about it. And I keep hoping somebody makes a 13 and a half lives of captain blue air movie. 
because I would watch that forever. So that sounds really cool. <sighs> Captain Blue Bear, you're the man. <laughs> All right, our last question of the night. Your last meal. What is it, Steve? I think just French fries. <laughs> just French fries. Just French fries. All right. um, Respect. Yeah, French fries is my favorite food, but I rarely eat them nowadays because they're you know not the healthiest thing for you. So it's like I only whenever I eat them, it's like a special occasion. So I think yeah, if I'm going out, I'm just uh, give me like a giant plate of uh, French fries, like stacked over my head with me standing up. Oh, okay. All right, Donna. How about you? Um, I would have to choose between either challah bread French toast, mm-hmm. which is amazing when it is made properly and the bread is very, very fluffy and it's not just regular French toast. It's like really, really thick eggy bread, even in addition to the eggs that are put on it. Or I would have traditional Neapolitan pizza. So I, mm-hmm. I live in LA and I've lived here for a long time, but I'm originally from New York. So I'm, I used to think I was super picky about New York to LA pizza, but then I went to Italy in 2013. Then I'm part Italian American. And then I had like real pizza from Naples. And so now I'm super obsessed with like proper, proper pizza, but they have all these different flavors of pizza in Neapolitan pizza. And they have one, which is entirely just like white sauce and mozzarella. And it's like an entirely white, pizza and the way it's made it's different than like just sliced pizza you get like your own little tiny personal pizza and it's baked in a brick oven and it's i don't really know how to describe it but if you just look up neapolitan pizza and can Mm. find anywhere that you can get neapolitan pizza it is amazing so i would either have hollow french toast or the white version of proper neapolitan pizza de napoli Respect. That sounds delicious. Like I, really so quick, I yeah, I'll be on Google in a minute. <laughs> I just want to add a holla French toast to my uh, last meal, just so I can say holla, <laughs> holla and fries. <laughs> um, man, I see. I think my my large personness is about to come out because uh, my last meal there would be cheese fries and nachos oh, and barbecue chicken wings. <laughs> there would be a chicken Philly sandwich on uh, toasted bread. There'd be a large cheese pizza and a deep dish pizza with barbecue sauce because that's deep dish sacrilege. And, uh, see, I grew up in uh, Chicago on the north side, so deep okay. dish is like the only way I knew how what? to pizza. <laughs> when, when you've had a real deep dish, like I'll tell you right now. So I've been in New York a couple times and I've had a couple of good slices, but nothing compares to a good deep dish like done proper. Now there's crappy deep dish all over. If you you think Pizza Hut is deep dish, no, that is hot trash. That is not. <laughs> please never eat that. Please don't do that to yourself. Do not compare the two. That should just be called pizza dish because it's not. It's not in our stuff. It's not the way it's supposed to be done. Um, but yeah, mine. Mine would be a smorgasbord of all these things that I'm not allowed to eat. Like I can have like a slice, but I would just go to town. Like my last meal would be just me smashing these things and enjoying them to pieces. So that would be me. Cool. Excellent. Oh. Mm. Man, I'm hungry. It's 1 a.m. It's 1 a.m. and I'm over here. Oh man, where could I where could I go get some awesome? Oh, okay. All right, back to work. So to wrap up the show, we like to do this thing where we talk about our game of the year. Now, I don't know if Donna's a gamer, and I don't want to throw her under the bus. And I, I know Steve, like he games a little, but not a lot. He's working on the comics and developing his craft. So for tonight and tonight only, it won't be our game of the year. It's gonna be our movie of the year. Because I feel confident that you guys will all have a good pick. So, Donna, what is your movie of the year so far? Um, I'm super behind in seeing movies. I just saw Coco, and it was amazing. Oh my goodness, I, yes! I didn't. I'm not saying I cried, but I cried. I cried so much. I mean, I love Dia de los Muertos, and I love just the idea of being able to always connect with your ancestors, and especially that they're being one specific day, but kind of that they're there with you forever. And that it's the afterlife, but it's not necessarily a thing of mourning. It's the fact that you're always connected to each other. If you're in different worlds, like all the celebration, all of the colors, all of the like spirit animals and stuff. I love that movie. I cried so much. I've been wanting to see it forever and I finally saw it. And I am very, very behind in movie seeing. I haven't seen other movies yet this year, but Coco will still probably be the top movie if not. I mean, it'll at least be like top three, if not remain the top one for me. Nice. No, fully, fully respect it. And uh, I love the you... animation. It's just, it's just amazing. Ooh, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. So the, the flower bridge to this day, probably the most beautiful wow. thing I've ever seen in an animated movie. I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I love Pepita, the um the the big jaguar spirit animal who flies. Um that thing that thing I'm not gonna say it gave me nightmares, but I've had dreams that thing's been in my dreams and I'm not okay <laughs> with meeting it in any other way other than watching it on a TV show, like in a movie. I don't, 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 don't want to dream about it. Internet. I don't know if you've seen those memes on the internet where a person is just like, look, it's a bear. It starts eating meat. Yay, hi, Fluffy. That's how I am with <laughs> animals. But especially if it was like a Technicolor, like flying majestical jaguar. I mean, she's also, I think it's a she. Like she's very, very friendly. Like she's big and kind of imposing, but she's very loving. But even if she was ch- like chewing off my arm, I'd be like, kitty friend. I hope, I hope this is nutritious for you. <laughs> Yay, kitty friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not how I view it. I view it as no. I need to get away from you fast. <laughs> I mean, I actually I get around LA without a car. I take public transit and use Uber and Lyft. So if I had like a giant flying Jaguar to like not have to do any of that, that would be amazing. That For be sure. No, any I'd, kind of I'd fun animal. No. <laughs> All right, Steve. How about you, bud? Movie of the year. Um, I love this question because actually I break this is I break my movies down exactly this way. I um I class how I. Uh, pick my break my movies I whatever movies I see in a given year is how I pick my favorites so like for example um I didn't see um Akira when it came out you know when it first came out I saw it many years later but the year I watched Akira that was my favorite movie of the year um this year you know still early um but I think Lady Bird is gonna uh, run the gauntlet and be my favorite movie of 2018 I saw it uh maybe about um maybe two three weeks ago and i was just uh blown away at the theaters like oh wow this is um this is just such a great movie um it she's a catholic school girl i was a, a catholic school guy um back in my day so i could relate to that aspect of it and uh, she she wants to be a writer i'm a writer so i could relate to that aspect of it and yeah just so much of it um was relatable and accessible and i just really came away with uh it was bl- super funny at various points too, and also super dramatic it just yeah a movie that just brought so much to the table i loved it a lot and i think it's going to be end up running the table as being my uh favorite movie of 2018. see everyone keeps telling me to go see it but my problem is that i had to sit down for two hours it wasn't actually movie. it was a short movie i think it was about was an hour it? and a half long okay uh, I'll add it to the list. I'll, I'll try to try to see if I can't get into it. Now, for me, it, it's so hard because one is so fresh in my memory, but the other one, I have just I talk about it almost every day at work. Uh, I it's it's I'm gonna go with Black Panther. I want to say Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider was so good. I loved it. I had such a blast. I know people didn't like it, but when you played the game, you had so much backstory. You knew what was coming, and it just filled in really well. But the reason Black Panther is it's gonna stay my number one is because my kids, my my so I teach it in an in inner city school. Uh, about ninety two percent, ninety something percent of our kids are are living below the socioeconomic line, and they still will be in class playing games, and someone will make a great play, and I'll hear Wakanda forever, and then we all jump in Wakanda forever. We go. <laughs> cool. It has become a war cry, and I love it. I love it i love seeing my kids with that kind of joy and and i'm just gonna say right now i think black panther is some of the best role models i've seen in a comic book movie in a long time because they make the moral choice but they also make the right choice even when they realize we can't do it the way we've always done it we have to make change here's how we do it we we open and give opportunities and there's some lines in that movie that are just gut-wrenchingly tough to deal with and i I, I love it to pieces. I'm so grateful that that movie came out and it was done the way it was done. So, yeah. All right. Well, this is where we normally wrap up the show. So we'll start off with Steve. Steve, what are you working on? Where can people find you? Uh, let's let's start sharing out your awesomeness, bud. Uh, I'm on. I'm relatively easy to find on the on the social media. Um, I'm both on Instagram and Twitter at it's at Steve Waldinger, that's S-T-E-V-E-W-A-L-D-I-N-G-E-R. I do a thing, a little thing called Comic Prov, where I make uh, live improvised comics. Um, 
my uh, how it works is the artist uh, this weekend at WonderCon. The artist is Donna filling in for uh, regular artist Lady Beaver. Uh, but the artist will draw the comic first without me knowing what's going to be drawn. When the comic's finished, I then fill in the words uh, without the artist knowing what's going to be written. And it makes for just a, a very fun, very lively comic book making experience. Um, we're on Instagram and uh, Twitter at Comic Prov, C O M I C P R O V. And I am our, uh, the podcast that I host with my friend Chris is called the Episode One Podcast. Uh, we talk about the premiere episodes of uh, new TV shows and we break them down for you. I always think the show is about Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace. Chris always corrects me and then we get to our task and it's all fun. Um, we're on. For that, you can go to, to listen to it, you can go to episode1pod.libsyn.com. We're also on uh, Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. The, we have a direct link you can use. It's tiny.cc slash episode1. And we're on, we also have a Twitter and uh, Instagram. It's at episode one pod uh stay tuned we have a lot of great shows coming up and um, i'm planning on some uh really cool guests in the near future hopefully we'll have um mr mo on in the near future i would love to and dude i just want to point out you are way more professional and better at this whole thing the ot still doesn't have a twitter why Meh. because well, we I just want... Instagram yeah because for... i don't want to do it I just want to talk to all the wonderful people on the line. I just want to be like, hey, guys, I'm Coach Mo. Yeah, I also do the OT. I love you. So I just want to point out, you are awesome. Way to, that, that, oh. was, that was some professionalism to the highest degree. Oh, you, were, you were a stud. That's all I got to say. I'm tearing up right now. <laughs> <laughs> and our other awesome guest for tonight, uh, Donald Littorisi, where, where can they find you? Where, share all your stuff out for the guests or for the fans, the family. Okay, well, um, I also am relatively easy to find on the internet. My uh, Twitter and Instagram handle are the same. It's at DrawDVL. My middle name is Victoria, hence I use my initials instead of having people attempt to spell my very long and sometimes confusing last name. So that's at D-R-A-W-D-V-L. And uh, my website is also drawdvl.com. I need to update that. I think that my Twitter and my Instagram are a bit more current. But things that I am working on. This weekend, I've been working filling in for Lady Beaver, who is the regular artist in Comic Prov. It's been a lot of fun working at WonderCon and getting to draw people's comics. And then Steve will do the writing for it. And he doesn't see what I'm drawing. So it's kind of kind of cool to get back into improv and do it in a comic form. So that's what I've been doing this weekend. Um, in general projects I'm working on, I'm working on something called Local Labyrinth, which is a story, uh, kind of a series of vignettes about different characters and one main character going into different places with hidden images and hidden animals and kind of exploring lots of different parts of, I guess it's mostly LA, but it's just kind of in general. And I'm also, uh, in addition to doing cartoon stuff, I do botanical illustrations. So I've been working on a lot of botanical illustration pieces. So that's a lot of things with drawing plants and kind of capturing the natural world. And in general, I work on creating zines and stories and greeting cards and comics. And I've been working on more things for my portfolio, which once I have more information and can finalize why I've been doing that, I will share that online. And let's see, I also am an educator in after school program. So I'm always working on the projects and the lesson plans I'm doing for my students. I work for the city of LA in a couple of after school programs and I teach kids cartooning and comic book art, which is how to tell your stories with pictures and words and sequentially. And I also teach a class called character design and concept art, which is instead of focus more on drawing, this one's focused on sculpture. So I teach the kids how to use Sculpey clay, which is kind of like modeling clay, except if you choose to, you can bake it in an oven and then it becomes like a fully hard figurine. But I teach the kids how to come up with a character, how to pose the characters, move them around. And then the very end of class, I teach them how to make claymation comics, which is basically they pose the character around I help them photograph them and it doesn't actually move like claymation but each of the frames are posed differently and then it's just kind of like a three-dimensional comic that I help them caption mm -hmm. so I'm basically hard at work on my stuff working with students and also working on drawing plants and working with a local labyrinth series and anything you check out of mine online koalas come up a lot <laughs> I very much like koalas and they kind of work their way into everything and puns <laughs>
They are the second cutest of the bear family. <laughs> you know, they're actually not bears. People don't always know that. They're, they're I, the, marsupials. They'll always be bears. They carry them around in a pouch. People are barely aware of the fact <laughs> that koalas are koalified marsupials. Mm -hmm. Boom, there we go, puns and koalas. I think respect. I'm respect. Uh, so uh, you can find me at Coach Hulk. And um, I just followed, you know, all the things that were just pointed out because they were said so well. So you guys just got some sweet follows. So I hope that you took the time when they were doing all that awesome professional worky stuff to follow as well, because these are some great folks. And I just I'm so glad that I got to hang out and just talk and share little little memories. And uh, yeah, I, I write for the PSVG. I teach. I coach the sports. Life's good. So. I, yes, I did promise that I would get some of those things out that I've been working on writing wise. However, I am a coward and I'm super scared to share out my feelings. So I'm going to continue to stare at the beautiful writing that is over 2000 words and some change. And eventually when I'm ready, it will be submitted. So with that, awesome listeners, wonderful family, we're going to say game over. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. This has been a production of the Play Some Video Games Podcast Network. Find more great content at PlaySomeVideoGames.com. <laughs>